All right, so I think we'll get started. The first thing I want to do is go through some introductions. So we're with Baylor Scott and White Health here in Temple, Texas. Uh, we have here Dr. Schnitker. We have two of our other residents. I'm the recruiting chief resident. Uh, Dr. Murchison James is our other chief resident, and then we also have Lillian, who's one of our other residents as well. Hello, I'm James. Uh, you probably can see me in some one of the bottom boxes. Um, so yeah, I've been the one emailing you guys, and thanks for all your awesome responses on the survey. Um, we definitely uh, really appreciate it, and hopefully we can answer some of those questions you guys had. Yep. I'm James Schnicker, the program director, and I appreciate you joining us as well. We really hope that this is helpful for you to learn a little bit more about the interview process. And we know this year is going to be very stressful for everyone involved. And, and hopefully we can start to answer some of the questions. It's still very early on. And so there's a lot that's unknown. So we, we hope that y'all uh, are able to, to get some useful information from this. And if, if we don't answer your questions this time around or something you come up with, we don't know the answer, just call us back or, or contact us and we'll try and, we'll try and keep in touch. Hi everybody, I'm Lillian Yakon. I'm one of the R2s, PGY3. I'm super excited to be here. So glad you guys are joining us. Um, we've worked really hard to make this as beneficial as possible. And just like Dr. Schnitger said, if there's anything that we don't address or you come up with something else, please reach out to us and we'd love to help. All right, so let's get started. So welcome everyone. So I want to go over a 10 to 15 minute presentation. And then like I said earlier, we can open it up to questions. Um, the, the main goal of this is to give you guys at least some advice on how you can make yourself uh, stand out during this process and maybe hopefully relieve some of your fears. So let's see here. So the situation that we're in is directly tied to the COVID pandemic. And due to those precautions, the, there's been some coalitions, which includes the ACGME, so MD, DO um, programs have recommended that all residencies conduct virtual interviews. And this is the same for medical students and fellowships as well. Um, this is something they recommend to everyone. So there's no in-person interview, so everything will be conducted virtually. And this presents some challenges, mostly because it's really difficult to figure out whether you're going to be a good fit for a program when you have limited information to go on. So hopefully we can help you a little bit with that. So what to look for. So your education is your biggest investment in your career and you wanna make sure you're making the right choice. And it's not simply picking the biggest name, however, that can be important, but you really wanna do your research and what you'll have to do is you'll have to do most of this research online and also determine whether it's a good fit when you actually do the virtual interviews. So important things to consider whether it's going to be a good fit for you are education, the culture within that department, the location, research opportunities, job opportunities. These are just to name a few. So as far as educational opportunities, some things you may want to look at are are the faculty fellowship trained in that subspecialty? And do you get a strong clinical experience from day one? So are you gonna be able to start looking at the imaging procedures, um, or the, the imaging studies, the procedures, you know, whatever it is. Um, and is there sufficient patient population to go around? So for instance, our residency has about a 2 million patient population. So there's usually sufficient amounts of studies that can go around and each resident can get involved very early. So these are some things you wanna look at. And then you wanna look at whether there's an overall healthy and collaborative department. And I'll kind of touch on that in a little bit. And then is there up-to-date technologies? And like I said earlier, research opportunities if you're interested. And then some personal considerations. One of the big ones is location. So considering your social life, you're not just gonna be working 24 hours you're going to want to look into restaurants, sporting events, you know, whatever it is that you find interesting as far as doing on your in your spare time. You may want to look at the cost of living, you know, whether you can buy a house, uh, save money for loans or retirement. And then are you close to friends and family? Because this directly ties to your personal happiness. And then also look at work-life balance. So 
maybe ask about. They may provide you some of this information, but call schedules, vacations, holidays. And then if you have a significant other, you know, what are their preferences and considerations? Because that'll be really important for your happiness as well. And then as far as job opportunities, is this location, this geographic area, is this a place that you want to work after you're done with all your education? Because most residents will work within that geographic area. It's no hard and fast rule. I mean, we have residents that end up working across the nation, but I'd say most of them are in this general area. So that may be something to consider where you want to work after all of this. Um, other things you may want to look at are, do they frequently hire within the department? Because this can really give you an idea of what the department culture is like and whether residents actually enjoyed their experience during the residency. Um, because then if they want to go work there afterwards, it, it, it says that they likely enjoy that experience. And then other things are state and national representation. So connections for future jobs, you know, that can always be helpful and something you should always consider. And then as far as department culture, some considerations are, are residents a main priority in the program? Uh, do they care about your happiness and your educational needs? And do you feel comfortable asking questions and fine tuning your knowledge? Because having that one-on-one -on -one time with your faculty is really helpful and being able to ask your questions and gauge that knowledge can really pinpoint some of the things that will make you a better radiologist or any other specialty as well. So other things are, do they plan social events for team bonding? You know, with COVID th that's been pretty difficult uh, with all the precautions, but you know, you may wanna look at social media and see if this is something that's important to them. And then just some general considerations, you know, are you going to get the best education and are you going to get the best job opportunities? But you do want to consider your happiness because if you're happy during that time period, that will translate to being a good resident because you're going to feel motivated. Um, and then once you, you know, stand out within your residency, then not only do you get a good education, but potentially job references, and then that will further build your future career. So what to ask? So when you're actually on the virtual interview, you know, what are you going to ask um, to kind of determine whether this is going to be a good fit? And this could be related to the faculty, the department culture, the clinical experience. But you want to do some outside research on the Internet. You want to come prepared and be knowledgeable about that individual program, because showing that you've done your research is really beneficial when programs are considering you as an applicant, because it shows that you've put in that work. Um, and you're actually interested and enthusiastic about it. But you may want to look into faculty backgrounds, the, loca the location, fun things to do in the city, because you won't actually be going to that actual location. And so having an idea of what there is to do, cost of living, social events, things like that can be beneficial. And then if, if there's any information on equipment or the research presence at that program, if you're interested. So additional research that you can do is social media pages. I know a lot of programs have begun, begun creating social media pages and some have had these social media, social media pages prior to this. And this can really show whether a program's committed to selling their program because it shows that this is important to them and showing the department culture, um, you know, it can be just showing equipment or, you know, whatever it is, that can be helpful. And then if they go above and beyond and create videos, it can be really important to show the emotion and conviction of the residents and faculty. And is this something they believe in? And is this, is this a program they want to sell? Um, so just getting into some more technical things regarding virtual interviews is when it comes to your audio, you want to have a quiet environment. So you don't want to have interruptions. So I wouldn't completely turn your cell phone off because if someone needs to get a hold of you, like say your internet gets disconnected, you want to have your phone available if you need to call someone, but you also don't want it to distract you. So you may want to keep it on silent, maybe in another room or somewhere where the notifications are not distracting you. And the same thing goes for messages, programs, um, anything like that that may uh, distract you. So I would probably shut down any any programs before you get started and then check your mic. So 
most newer laptops will have a sufficient mic for video conferencing, but if for some reason you have, say, an, update, uh, an outdated laptop, you may want to potentially buy maybe a cheaper option um, for a mic. And, and you really just want to avoid reverberations and echoes, so that'll be important. And then as far as lighting, you really just want to minimize harsh glare from sunlight. So natural light's okay, but you just don't want it harsh and you want to minimize shadows. So you want to illuminate your face equally and you don't want to be in a completely dark room. And you should be able to figure this out with natural light, but if you do need some kind of lamp or ring light, uh, you can put that behind you or behind the screen so then it's illuminating your face completely. And then as far as your background during the virtual interview, I would choose a neutral background. So you, you may not want distracting pictures or objects that are going to take the attention away from you and away from the applicant. So this is something you want to consider. And then your camera. So most newer laptops have sufficient webcams, um, but you can consider that on a case by case basis. So um, I'm currently using a Logitech webcam, which I feel is superior to my MacBook Pro's webcam. Um, but it's just something, you know, you may want to consider since you're not traveling, if you have any spare cash, you know, it's just kind of a case by case basis. But when it comes to your camera, you want it to be at eye level. Um, you don't want to be hunched over. You want it to be showing your face at the correct level. So, um, and you also don't want to be um, looking at yourself on the actual video conferencing software you want to be looking at the webcam because they'll that's what they can see um, when they're looking at your video and then as far as interconnect internet connection so it must be dependable so you want to avoid dropouts if possible like i said sometimes this just happens spontaneously um, but you can consider using an ethernet connection so most wi-fi routers have an ethernet connection so if this is something you want to do to prevent dropouts. That's an option there. And then make sure you plug your computer into a power source so that you have sufficient battery and your computer basically doesn't die while you're doing this interview. And just some other options that may be helpful. Um, you can record yourself and this can be helpful to inspect your behavior, your speech patterns, minimize ums and uhs. Sometimes you don't realize you have certain behaviors or speech patterns if you haven't recorded yourself. So it may be helpful. It's just something you can consider. Um, but you really want to focus on having proper eye contact, avoid fidgeting or moving in the chair. You just want to avoid distractions because you really want the focus to be on you and what you're saying. And then other things to consider are enunciation. So try to avoid mumbling, make sure they can hear what you're saying. And then also your facial expressions are important because you want to demonstrate enthusiasm. So this is the only impression that a program's really gonna get when they're trying to determine who you are as a person. So you wanna be yourself, um, but you also wanna show appropriate enthusiasm, You know, acting interested. Um, because that can be really important for the ranking processes. You know, does this person want to be here? And so ideally, it's a calm and engaged manner. Um, and then as far as posture, you want to be seated up straight. Um, I briefly touched on this. The camera should be at the eye level and avoid leaning over. And you may want to prop up your laptop if needed so that you're actually at that eye level. Um, and then I also talked about not rocking back and forth. So. Um, some other tips, you know, I would potentially avoid typing or writing during the actual virtual interview because that could be distracting. If you have to do one, I would say likely writing because if you're typing right in front of the webcam, that may be somewhat distracting. And then as far as your setup, um, you can take a picture of your setup and then that may be helpful to replicate on interview day. Um, just trying to get the same lighting and make sure everything's ready to go. And so you have less to do on that interview day. I don't know what she's doing. Um, and then the same time of day, um, just keep in mind that your natural light will change throughout the day. So if you are planning on that, you may want to consider that as far as the time of day that your interview will actually be at um, when you're planning this. 
Um, and then as far as the program or video conferencing software that you're using, you may want to download that prior to the interview. Some, some programs may be web browser based, so you, you may not have to download it, but you may want to inspect the layout and familiar, familiarize yourself with the interface just so that you're prepared and you're not potentially trying to figure out how to navigate through it during the interview. And then also practice your responses. So potentially say these out loud, potentially record them. Um, big topics that are important for the interview process are knowing your CV, uh, why this specialty and potential hobbies, because these are frequently asked in interviews. Now it does depend per specialty, but in radiology, at least in my experience, when I was interviewing for residency and interviewing for fellowship, Hobbies are something they all, almost exclusively touched on. I mean, they talk about other things as well, but hobbies are always a big topic. So you want to know those well enough so that you'll know your responses, but you can shift your focus to being enthusiastic and being engaged with the interviewer. And then the same thing goes for emotional intelligence as well, um, showing that you have care for the patient needs and care. Um, that's, that's always important to show that emotional conviction. And then you may want to practice your interview, do a test run with either friends or family or the home institution that you're at. We will be having a mock interview with our A&M medical students, but you may want to reach out to your home institution and see if this is something that they're offering just to get some practice. And as far as the dress during the virtual interview, it should be the same as if you did an in-person interview. So business attire, you want to avoid distracting patterns or colors. So you want to look professional, but you also don't want to be distracting as well. And then the same thing goes for, um, you know, being well-groomed and hygiene and things like that. Um, as far as the actual interview day, I would enter the meeting at least 10 to 15 minutes early just so that you can make sure you're properly prepared. And then I would prepare all the settings and environment at least 30 minutes before, but you may want to be practicing, you know, the day before and kind of get an idea of what your setup's going to look like, but I would say at least 30 minutes. Um, and then you may want to notify, you know, roommates, friends, family, uh, that you're having an interview during that time to avoid interruptions. And the same thing goes for if you have any pets or your roommates have pets, just to avoid, you know, distractions, barks, meows, as, as as best possible. And so then when you're finally evaluating programs after the interview process, um, you know, you really want to look at the resident to resident relationships. And this can be either through social media um, or if that program's offering a resident hangout the night before. I know that our program will be offering this um, just to talk with the residents kind of one on one. We're not able to do a pre-interview dinner like we have in the past. And so hopefully we can supplement that, um, not only getting to know the residents, but also becoming familiar with the program itself and kind of knowing what to ask, maybe develop some questions and kind of get an idea of how things work. And then another thing to consider is department culture. You know, we've already somewhat talked about this, um, you know, social events, things like that. And you can always check social media. Um, other things to consider are past residents hired in the department. We kind of briefly touched on this um, and that this can indicate that they enjoyed their experience during residency. And then another big topic is moonlighting opportunities. So whether they offer in-house or out-of-house moonlighting, and this is very specialty dependent. So in radiology, in-house moonlighting means that you'll be under your faculty's license. So the same faculty that you would normally work under during your residency, you'll then do, do your moonlighting with them. And so you won't be required to have a state license or malpractice insurance. So out of house will be different. You will need a state license and malpractice insurance. And that, that can be costly. And you know it really just depends on what you wanna do, but it may be something to look into. And I know our program offers moonlighting from day one. We have IR moonlighting uh, right when you start. Um, so just an idea of is moonlighting, not only do they have moonlighting, but is it something that you're going to do throughout residency? And then as far as the resources regarding this webinar, we will be uploading our PowerPoint to our website, which is at bswradresidency.org. 
and we'll actually be, since we are recording this webinar, uh, we'll have that up on BSW Rad Residency, the U YouTube channel, and then also have a, an abbreviated uh, video on my personal YouTube. Um, and then we have some helpful resources. These were just some that were specifically designed by Graduate Medical Education and AMC that basically goes through the virtual interviewing process and some considerations that you may have. All right, so that does it for the presentation. Um, we did look at some of your surveys and some of the information, um, some of your concerns, and we wanted to address a few of those topics and then we'll open it up to the floor. So I'm gonna hand it over to James and let him go from here. Hey, James, you want to may unmute yourself? Sorry about that, guys. Uh, I thought I had unmuted. Um, so will programs interview more or less applicants? And so we've talked about this a little bit uh, with you know our program director, Dr. Schnicker. Um, and there was a recent, uh, I guess, study that came out from some of the fellowships that were coming out, like the pulmonology uh, fellowship that showed that they had a significant increase in the number of applica applications per applicant. Uh, so they were applying to more programs. And so that's definitely something we expect this year. I think that, um, you know, there's a less cost associated with traveling this year. So I think there's going to be more uh, people are going to apply to more programs. And so it will be a little bit of a challenge to figure out who's actually interested in, in interviewing and who's not. Um, and so one of the things that, you know, we've definitely felt and in the past is, and I think will be really important this year is, you know, reaching out to those programs um, through email, you know, court, contacting their coordinators. Uh, to let them know that you know you have maybe ties to the area or you're really interested in that program because i think that with the increased number it's going to be a challenge to figure out who really is interested in that program because in general most people do tend to stay in the areas where they've been at um you know nothing to say anything about being on the west coast or east coast or in, in, you know the south like it's just the fact that you've been in that area um you know that's just where people tend to stay um but that being said i mean we i think in a couple years ago we had a person who uh, went to medical school up in New York, but they had a lot of family ties uh, to Texas. It wasn't in their application specifically, um, but they reached out to our coordinator and we ended up getting them a spot, an interview spot. So, um, you know, just if you reach out to the coordinators, and I know this happened as well with, with you know, my fellow medical student class, um, you know, it can definitely help you as far as being able to stand out more in those applications, especially with the increased number. Um, but definitely, you know, use, use, be judicious about it. Don't just, just you know, email every single coordinator because I don't think that'll be super helpful. But I think that if you can figure out who, who specifically, you know, you're really interested in those programs, I think that's, that's definitely a way to go about that. And a weight rotation option. So, you know, this is another question we got um, a couple times. And so HDME has laid out a, a plan for program places that don't have, you know, programs, whether residency programs in your specific areas. Um, so if you don't have a radiology residency program or a specific program that you're interested in applying to, whether that's a surgical subspecialty or, some, or, some, or something along those lines, um, you are allowed to do an away rotation. Um, our program is open to accepting away rotations um, here in, in Temple. So we are really only allowed to accept people from Texas and the surrounding states based on the way ACGME is. Um, but if you don't have a radiology program and we're reasonably close, um, the closest alternative for you to come to, um, if you want to contact our program coordinator, uh, Jennifer Little, um, we'd be happy to kind of work with you to kind of make that uh, make that a reality. Um, it's definitely not, um, you know, it, it's definitely difficult. I know traveling nowadays and, and um, you know, getting these things set up, but um, and there are some institutions I know that aren't having any away rotations. So um, I know that's the case in some of the major cities here in Texas as well. So it's definitely something that, you know, reaching out. Um, you know, contacting that program and seeing what's going on it might be helpful. Um, I don't, you guys have anything else to add to this one specifically? Uh, Dr. Schnicker or, or Lillian or anybody? Or no, I mean, if, if you don't have a uh, radiology residency at your home program, um, then it's something I think you probably should explore because um, otherwise, it kind of leads to the one of the follow up questions here at some point is going to be, 
should you get a letter of recommendation from somebody in radiology? Well, if you can't do a rotation in radiology, those are a lot harder to come by. So that is something that I would encourage you to at least look at. This year, I think everyone's going to understand um, that you weren't able to do one. Um, so if you have the opportunity to do a dedicated radiology rotation, I would encourage you to do that. Dr. Mark Garner, do you have something you want to say? Oh, yeah, I do. I handle some of the elective stuff and, and work with Jennifer Little on it. And so, like you said, if, if you are if you're in uh, A&M, it's very easy to if you're on a different campus doing an, an elective here. Otherwise, if you're close, like you said, Texas program, the out of state, it more has to do with if we're the closest program that offers the elective that you don't have. So you just have to have it doesn't have to be very formal, but someone from your institution to say, OK, we had to travel from Oklahoma through Dallas. Dallas didn't have anything. So, yes, you can do an in a way rotation here. And then we have several clinical electives and in research electives where you may just be able to write up a case report or something like that as options. And I think that's a good way to reach out to network because we can make sure that you're working on a project or, or meeting people that are involved in resident selection. And it's a way to also meet um, the residents and see the program. So I think it would be a smart thing to do if, if you fit into that category. Another, uh, another uh, I guess, way that you could get into that is if maybe you're doing medical school in a state far away, but if you have family in Austin and you're forced to quarantine in Texas near us, that's another uh, way that you're able to kind of get in the door to do an elective. Thanks, Dr. Schenker, and thanks, Dr. Workmeyer. Uh, much appreciated clarification on all of those. Um, okay, next slide. Um, letters of recommendation. This kind of fit with what Dr. Schnicker was mentioning about, you know, if you don't have an a yeah, specific radiology rotation, I think that as he mentioned, I think we'll be more, I think most programs will be understanding this year, but that being said, if you can set up some sort of a way rotation so you can uh, get an, uh, an actual letter from um, a radiologist, um, I think that will be helpful. I know there are some subspecialties out there that um, really require, you know, we're only going to look, we're only going to look at letters from these people. Um, and I don't, I can't ex say what they're going to do in this situation because they're definitely going to be programs that don't have that, those resources for you to get all those letters. And so hopefully they're understanding um, I, I feel like we will be for sure, but um, I can't speak for all those other programs. Anything else you want to add to that, Dr. Schnicker or Dr. Berkman? Oh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've read thousands of letters of recommendation now, and so you'll get a you'll get a lot of advice on that. And some people say, oh, you should have at least two letters of recommendation from radiology. I haven't actually found that 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 necessarily leads to a good letter of recommendation. Um, sadly, y'all aren't going to like hearing this. Most letters of recommendation, the people don't know you well enough to give a truly personalized ones. And so what I tell people is, yeah, if you could get at least one radiology letter of recommendation, I think that's good. That means you probably worked with the radiologist closely enough to show a genuine interest. Um, but what you really want is good letters of recommendation that are written from a personal standpoint so we can get to know who you are. And that's always been true. Even when people interview in person, you only have this snapshot of a half day, you know, a 30 minute interview to form an opinion. And a lot of times your letters of recommendation will give some insight as to who you were on a day to day basis when you're on a rotation. So I would actually encourage you to Look with not necessarily the big names. A lot of people assume, oh, I know this very well-known physician in the medical community. They're asked to write hundreds of letter recommendation. I would say almost universally, they're the ones who write the most generic letter recommendation. I look at it from the standpoint of I need the letter recommendation. Tell me more about who you are. So I would look at, at the people that you worked really well with and, and you feel like can write you the type of letter recommendation that kind of reveals your personality and who you are better. Thanks, Dr. Schnicker. Yeah, and another key thing to ask, you know, one of the keys that I tend to ask whenever I was asking for letters was not just ask for a letter recommendation, ask for a good letter recommendation. Um, because if you ask that question, they can at least have a way out if they don't really feel like they can write that for you rather than just saying letter recommendation. Um, as mentioned, I think that uh, emailing a program, like I said, be judicious about, um, you know, how how many places you're emailing. I think that, you know, you could get carried away with this if you emailed all the programs you applied to. Um, but that being said, I think that if there are several programs you're really interested in 
and that have really kind of stuck out to you that you might be wanting to, to potentially stay at, to go to um, for residency? I mean, because it is going to be, you know, for us, it's, you know, five years, four, four years in radiology specifically. Um, you know, email them. It's a, it's a big commitment, of course. So, um, you know, reaching out. Uh, I know I know that, like I said, I've had we've done it here at this program. And then I know that one of my uh, one of my good friends from medical school, I mean, he didn't even get an interview at the place he's actually at. He actually went to residency at. And so he only got that that uh, that uh, interview through emailing them. So it does work. You know, if you, if you, if you're, you pick the right times to send them and, and, you know, don't just kind of blanket email everybody. But um, one th it's just tell me something to think about. And the other thing that's come up a lot is applicant social media presence. Um, you know, if you're into social media as an applicant, that's great. Um, but I don't think it's not everybody's, you know, a, a, on social media. And that's totally fine. I think that from a program standpoint, I think they all need to be on social media. I think they need to be trying to reach out to you guys. Um, you know, you don't need to feel pressured to be posting all the time or, or be doing all these other type of things. I know that we're not specifically going to be using social media to determine whether or not you, you know, be a good fit. It's more... You know, if you use social media, I use social media, especially Twitter, um, just to get news and information. I feel like it's really great. I get all the articles I want to read about uh, in radiology really quickly, and I, and I love it. Um, but, you know, other people use other things. And so, I, you know, find what works for you, but don't feel like you're pressured to do it just because of the way the season is going with the virtual interview session. Um, you know, try to um, – but you definitely use it, I guess, to, to research the programs as – as Brett was mentioning, I think it's going to going to be a really strong way to tell whether or not the program is invested in, you know, their program as well as just trying to sell their program to you. Because, you know, if they're if they believe in their program, they're going to try to put it out there for, on social media, you know, in, on, on the Internet and that type of stuff so that they can show off what they have so, to try to get you guys interested. So I think that's definitely something that um, to look out for. Anything else you want to add, Dr. Schnicker? Uh, Dr. Brickmar on that one? Yeah, we've never we've never researched people uh, as part of that that process for it. Um, to me, your social media presence is kind of your personal business uh, as far as that goes. Um, so it's one of those that that I'm sure there are some programs that research every single applicant they're interviewing though. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. And then I guess we're going to open it up to any additional questions. You guys can unmute yourselves um, if you want to. Um, as mentioned, um, you know, we're here to answer any questions. You can also just type in the chat function. We'll be following along in the chat. Um, that's another feature we can use um, to answer any other questions you guys might have. Um, so feel free to just kind of reach out. We'll probably stay on for, you know, five, ten minutes if there's not any questions, um, you know. But uh, obviously we're, I'm, I'm available to reach out. So what are your favorite aspects about the program slash city? Um, so I'll let, you know, everyone uh, in, I guess, talk about this, but I'll tell you what I, I really like. Um, you know, I, I really like the cost of living here. Um, I did, I am from Texas. Um, so I, 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 you know, staying in Texas was, was something I, I really wanted to do. Um, but also my wife's family is really close. They're up in Waco. And so having them close by, and then I have family down in Austin as well. And so that's just a very short drive. And then all the different activities, whether it's outdoors, hiking, um, you know, going to state parks, things like that. Um, there's lots of golf here, which I love. Um, and then there's a, a great kind of, you know, outdoor scene. I've gone to ACL a bunch of times, uh, Austin State Limits, which is a music festival. Um, it probably it won't happen this year, of course, but in prior, prior years, um, I've gone and spent the whole weekend there. And it's been just a great time. Um, but it's just, it's just a real, there's, there's something for everyone, everybody here. I think we have residents that are both um, uh, single and, and, you know, wanting to kind of, you know, go down and, and, and go down to Austin and have, have weekends. And then, but you also have the opportunity to have a house and be able to kind of start a family if that's where you're at. Anything else you guys want to add on that one? As far as, uh, yeah, I can, I can kind of address that. So mm -hmm. I, I feel very similar. So what I really like about Temple is that you have the low cost of living and it's a smaller city. So there's probably about 100,000 people within the general area. We do cover about a 2 million patient population, which is like a large city. But when it comes to the actual living, um, it's a little more it's a little more comfortable, but you're not far away from any bigger activities like James was saying. I mean, you can easily go down to Austin. It's about 50, 50 minutes away. So if, if you're looking for, you know, some kind of restaurant, if you're into certain types of foods or maybe music or, you know, orchestra, symphony, things like that, 
that can be very accessible to you. And then as well, Dallas is about two hours away. Houston is about two and a half. So I've never felt isolated, you know, being in a smaller town, but you get all the benefits of a small town while also being close to, you know, these bigger cities and things like that. So that's what I personally enjoy. And, you know, I can go on weekends to pretty much wherever I want. Um, and so I, I find that very, very enjoyable. Yeah, and the Austin airport is, you know, on the north side of Austin. So it's really close. It's not even 50 minutes into Austin. It's like on the 45 minute end of the spectrum. And so a lot of people take that. I know Lillian's gone to London this last year before COVID. Um, Brett's been all over the world to uh, India and <laughs> Dubai and all sorts of things. Yeah, it's very accessible with our cost of living because, you know, you have the low cost of living being in a smaller town, but you can go to any of these nearby airports. And there's actually some really good flights out of Austin, like James was saying, to London. It's usually around $400 if you catch it at the right time. And obviously we're not doing international travel now, but it is something that residents are very good about, you know, you know, going on different vacations, things like that. We encourage that our residents do vacations. And then with the low cost of living and moonlighting experience, you're definitely going to be able to do that. Um, for me, I interviewed all over the place. I am from Texas, but um, I was not fixated um, to stay to Texas. I, I looked in interviewed in other states, um, but I really couldn't find a program that um, was better than Baylor Scott and White. Um, it had everything I needed. Uh, I, I did do an away rotation here, which unfortunately um, is difficult this year, but um, the emphasis on education and the importance that the entire hospital and uh, faculty place on that was so impressive. Um, and it really outshone in comparison to, to other programs that I had done away rotations at. Um, but honestly, the culture here is amazing. You feel like you become part of a family. And, uh, you know, I couldn't ask for more from the residency. Hey, Lillian, could you touch on, uh, there was one question here. It says, do you feel your program is adaptable, invested in departmental process improvement, and receptive to suggestions from residents since you were kind of talking about that? Sure. Oh, my gosh. Um, so, you know, I've only been here for a year, and I've had so many things that I personally have wanted to see. I've seen um, other residents suggest things. Dr. Schnicker, Dr. Berkemeyer. All of the faculty are amazing, um, super receptive to, to residents, really care about um, how we're doing, what we want to see um, within the program, um, and very receptive to our concerns and our ideas to make the program better um, and just really adapt it to our needs. Um, we have tons of resources, um, and given that fact, they still you know, give us opportunity to um, request for more things that um, we feel that we might not have. Um, but but there's so much and they're, they're so um, open to hearing from residents. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't know. I feel like my whole time here, I mean, so I'm now the chief resident, but I feel like since being here, I mean, things have changed a bunch, but they've changed in a lot of good ways, mainly because of the fact that the residents have been so involved as far as in implementing QI projects. I, I feel like, you know, we're, we are a very resident run or, uh, you know, program we don't have that many fellows we only have a couple of fellows and they really kind of enhance that resident experience here um but from a resident standpoint i mean you know we wanted better lectures you know as far as more core related lectures for you know the core exam and you know we got i got that done in two years you know we completely revamped our whole curriculum with the help of staff and residents and you know now we've also implemented in a new program i think this last year our pgy2s they wanted you know a little more specific pgy2 curriculum so we actually implemented that in, in 7 a.m lectures um during covid we actually had about six or seven qi projects going all the residents were involved in um we went to standardized templates throughout the you know all the residents um we also uh further uh improved our online resources um we have our own internal you know, YouTube channel that all our lectures are recorded on. Um, we also have a, um, you know, online source with all the different PDFs and things like that that we have through our organization. Um, and then we also went through and created, you know, help, rotation help sheets. So all those things were all brand new stuff that we, that had been present, but now we made them more formal. And that was all just resident driven, you know, during COVID when we had a little bit downtime because there were less studies coming through, you know, 
And so when you have an idea, um, I feel like it's just, it doesn't take much to find the, you know, a, a staff that wants to, you know, you is happy to help out and, and, and get you started. You know, you know, I have a research product zone with multiple staff and it's just, it's just, you know, it's all what you want to do and how you, how you want to take those opportunities. I don't think that there's any really limits on what you can do here. I, we're very fortunate in the sense that we're a, uh, uh, we're a kind of internal organization. So we have access to all our data that, um, you know, comes from the clinicians. Um, you know, we're not getting a bunch of outside referrals. We do get outside referrals, but a lot of it is internal referrals because of just the, our clinic model and how, uh, and how Baylor Scott and White is set up here in the central Texas region. And so it really allows for really, really interesting research. You know, we're very similar in that sense, like Mayo Clinic and things like that. Um, anything else you want to add on that, Dr. Schnicker, or, Dr. or Brett, or Dr. Berkmeyer? Yeah, I, I can add uh, some to it, um, <laughs> but yeah, there's, you, you know, you don't want to get me talking too much or I'll run out <laughs> the rest of the hour. Uh, no, what, what they mentioned is exactly right. Uh, a big part of my job as program director is to adapt the strengths of our system and our program to the changes we know are going to come. Uh, the, the radiology that you're looking at right now will be different than the radiology when y'all are finishing your residency. I can guarantee it, both in just the educational structure and just the way that we approach some areas. And so a big part of what we do in the residency program is every time we do our reviews with, with residents, I, I have an open door policy in general when people have concerns, they, they don't hesitate to come to me, but just part of the the review process, one of the last things I do is I ask them, you know, what do we need to work on? What can we do better? And because I know that in order to make the program run well, I've got to have the residents integrally involved in it. So it's got to work for them. And honestly, the best ideas often come to them because a lot of times I have this ACGME requirement. How are we going to do this? And I, that's how I get the ideas and say, okay, Here's what I'm thinking with it. And then we kind of bounce ideas off each other. But then that goes into the department as well. The residents are involved in the, the QI uh, committees, in the peer review committees. And so that there are major changes and developments in the department that are resident driven and also ones that the residents uh, are going to be involved with day to day once they're implemented. So we want them involved with it. And then on top of that, one of the great things about our structure institutionally is a multi-specialty clinic. We're not a bunch of private practice groups. We're all part of the same multi-specialty group. And so we have interdepartmental institutional QI committees that the residents are a part of as well. And so they've been responsible for making some major changes. Some of the uh, handoff initiatives, we have um, surveillance film reporting, we have critical result reporting. All of those uh, were very much um, involved radiology, some directly radiology driven. And so it's a wonderful environment in terms of that original question of, are we adaptable? Yes, both down on the program level to the departmental level to the institutional level. Sounds good. Um, next question we have is what's an average day like for the residents, uh, Brett and Lillian? I guess I'll let Brett go first and then I'll, I'll turn over to Lillian so you guys can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so um, so once you start, so day one, you know, you'll finish your year of internship and then you may, at least at our program, our internship allows us to do two months of radiology elective. So you will actually get some practice um, actually dictating and working with some of the faculty. And our program, if you match to our radiology program, you will automatically get the internship. And so I felt like that was really helpful to not only get to know my fellow radiology residents, but also get kind of a head start on radiology. So once you start on the first day, you're gonna be able to start reading any of the imaging. And we actually allow for radiology residents to start reading MRIs very early in the radiology residency. So for instance, MRI neuro studies, you're gonna be able to start reading those potentially in the first few months. And so throughout the radiology residency, at least at our program, you're gonna get plenty of MRI experience as well as procedures. Um, and, and I know James was talking about this a little bit, um, but since we only have two fellows in our uh, entire department, the, it's very resident driven. So you're gonna get plenty of procedure experience, which will not only help you for fellowship, but also potential job opportunities. 
And you're also going to get one-on-one -on -one checkouts from day one. So once you've reviewed some of this imaging, the faculty will come in and they'll go over the study with you. You'll ask questions and they'll kind of go over what the important findings and what the search pattern is. And then over time, you'll get more of a graduated responsibility where, you know, you, they may not have to go over the search pattern and certain things, but, you know, you may be able to send directly to your staff and then they'll let you know if there's something big that needs to be changed and if there's any teaching opportunities. So it, I've felt very comfortable with how it's progressed. Lillian, do you want to say something about that? Yeah, um, so, you know, just picking back, piggybacking off of what Brett said, um, you know, a lot of times you'll hear uh, that you, you, you hit the ground running, but you really do at this program. Um, they're going to put a dictaphone in your hand. Um, and so you'll, you'll start um, working through different uh, cases. Um, but the, the lovely thing that we have here is graduated responsibility. So, you know, you're never left out to dry. Um, you always have an upper level with you. And then um, faculty go through um, all the cases with you. So you have one-on-one -on -one checkouts, which is really important um, and really key to learning um, because you're not going to know it all. There's so much information in radiology. Um, and so having that one-on-one -on -one, um, time with your faculty to, to learn um, and then ha have them guide you and give you pearls about just from their experience um, and how to approach different studies is really important. Um, but, you know, the average day, you come in, depending on if you have procedures on the rotation, you'll you'll go through um, those cases and prepare and make sure you you know who's coming in. Um, and then you'll pick up cases. If you have procedures, you'll do those. Um, and then um, we have conference um, at noon um, that lasts about an hour long. And then you'll go back and finish off the day. Um, and essentially, you know, I, that's typically how it looks at most places. Um, depending on where you are in your training, you'll also have um, different tumor boards um, and multidisciplinary um, conferences that you'll attend and participate in, which is really helpful to round out your educational experience um, because those are things that you'll do on your own um, when you're um, an independent practitioner. Okay, um, next question. How do you promote resident wellness throughout training? And I mean, I feel like this is definitely something that um, we take very seriously um, as far as our program goes. I think that um, it's definitely something that's, you know, nationally being taken very seriously. Um, you know, we had, um, we've, we've definitely, not just our program, but even our institution has taken it very seriously just because of, you know, some of these, these terrible incidents that have happened around the country um, with residents just getting burned out um, and, you know, not, 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 not being well um, mentally um, from the stresses they're being put under, um, which, you know, I think that, the keys as Brett has mentioned and even Lillian's mentioned are just, you know, you need to enjoy going to work. I think that that's one of the things that, you know, Brett mentioned, if you're a happy resident, you're a good resident. And so you finding, um, finding um, whether or not, you know, the residents like to hang out together, you know, I mean, I went out, um, you know, we would go out all the time and we used to hang out. We used to do, uh, I guess, you know, before all this happened, we used to do, um, happy hours and baseball games and all sorts of things where we used to hang out and and do that and we, some of our new conferences would be must just resident hangouts we wouldn't actually have lecture during that time we'd actually go um to spend time you know enjoying each other's company because i think that that's you know you can you can give all these these seminars and whatnot but i think what really matters is having friends and family and and feeling like you have that support system and i think that when i look at the residents here I think of them not as, you know, just, you know, my co-residents. I think of them as family members. I think that, you know, they have my back. I think that I can rely on them for my for any, any issues I have come up. I know that, you know, I've had tough times. I know my fellow co-residents have had tough times. And you want that that ability to be able for them to step up whenever, you know, you have something come up in your life. Because life's going to happen, and you need that support system to be able to help you. And um, I think that's that's really important. Um, Lillian or Brett, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's really important. What are you saying? Um, you know, before this, we had monthly events. Uh, we'd have a social event with faculty and residents. So I was kind of getting into that a little bit with my presentation. You know, that's maybe something you want to look at. Uh, but we would have faculty and resident events monthly. And with COVID, it's been a little bit more difficult. Um, but we have tried to do different activities. I know we had like a ice cream day and um, you know, 
and we and we try to put this all on social media so people are aware of it. Um, so you can look at you know any of our uh, social media. I mean, there's probably a few examples there, um, but I'm sure Lillian, you know, she's mostly in charge of some of the wellness uh, initiatives. So I'll leave that up there. Yeah. So um, like James and Brett have uh, talked about, wellness is very serious here. Um, I, I would I would like to think that everybody feels like we go above and beyond to ensure that all the residents um, and even faculty um, feel like they have a well-rounded experience here um, and that, you know, you're not just a resident here to check out so many um, interpretations, but you're actually a resident, a whole person, and that um, we care about you and you are part of our family. Um, you know, so we, and I, we're talking about some things pre-COVID era, but, you know, welcome parties um, at Dr. Montgomery's house. He's the chairman of the department. Um, we have resident-specific happy hours. Um, sometimes a group of us will just go grab dinner. Um, we have some great restaurants here. Um, um, we did a potluck for Thanksgiving. Um, Dr. Vosick had a Christmas party for the residents and faculty. Um, and, you know, we still are trying, we're working on doing things um, that are COVID appropriate um, within um, whatever means that we have. Um, and so, you know, Lisa, our program co coordinator is amazing. Um, she bakes cupcakes for you um, for your birthday. Um, and we, we just do little um, things here and there to ensure that everyone's staying well and checking on each other. Um, and, you know, if there is something that you're interested in that you feel like um, we can enhance or uh, improve upon, this kind of ties back into uh, program responsiveness and adaptability, but um, they really are. And you can really uh, seek out faculty to help you improve those areas. Um, you know, we have a women in radiology group that we've started, which I'm super excited about. Um, and so there's just different outlets um, within our uh, program specific, um, but then also throughout our institution. So you can also interact with residents and other programs. Um, and that really um, is awesome. You know, I know there's a group of guys that would play basketball and it was interspecialty and even some of the med students would um, would uh, participate too. So um, we take wellness very seriously here. I think another point with wellness is identifying residents who are having trouble. And I think having the family environment is important for that because all the residents and faculty are looking out. Everybody's looking out for each other. And if we identify someone who might even have a stressor, even if they're not showing any signs of issues, we make it a point to ask them, how are you doing with that new baby that was just born? Is the baby sleeping? Do you have, you know, appropriate child care? You know, how are you doing with that? Or, you know, every six months we have resident reviews. And I know at, at the end of mine, one of them, you know, I always ask questions about how are you dealing with stresses? What, what kind of coping mechanisms? Is there anything that's overwhelming you? And so we actively seek to identify anyone who might be at risk for having issues and, and needing help and then and then we can intervene at that point. Yeah, and also uh, there are also uh, mechanisms within the GME uh, structure and the, the health plan that are specifically geared towards more professional support as well, which is definitely uh, part of your uh, support mechanism there because there's this is going to be a very stressful time for you in your life and everybody has different stressors and different ways that they manage them but there is uh, both physician peer support and more formal mental health support uh, mechanisms as well that are available so i want to assure you that it's uh, i completely agree with whatever everything that's said here is that one of the ways to make a, a good mental health uh, and wellness environment is to have people who enjoy what they do and support each other but sometimes that's not enough and like Dr. Berkemeyer mentioned, we want you to seek appropriate uh, appropriate um, assistance when you need it as well. Thank you everyone for answering that question. Um, just to clarify on Dr. Berkemeyer's response to this, uh, our noon conference, I will say it's only gonna be, right now it's currently only available for those internally, um, the way it's set up. So you have to be within the organization. Um, that being said, it's something that, um, just because of images and stuff like that, um, it is something we can move forward slowly with trying to make it available more uh, online as a more national presence. Um, we have to kind of get some more approvals and figure that out on that side of things. Um, 
before we can do that. And I know if you were to sign up for, let's say, a virtual way rotation in the way like Dr. Berg was talking about the research opportunity with us, and then you would do a research thing, I, I can get you easy access to the the uh, noon lectures at that time as well if you were going to do something like that. So just to clarify on that, um, and then we'll go on to this next question is uh, by, um, can you tell us about uh, call shifts and ex how much autonomy is expected depending on PGY levels? So I think that's a great question. I think that Lillian got into a little bit, which was with graduate responsibility. I think our program does a really good job of understanding that when you start out on day one, uh, you don't really know what you're saying or what you're looking at or what you're doing. So I think that uh, it's very much, you, you know, you have that one-on-one -on -one, um, ability to s sit down with the staff and them to go over the, the um, study with you and make sure you understand what you're looking at. I think that um, it's, you know, it's it's definitely a process, you know, each month when you're on, a, we, we put you guys on four week rotations for your first essentially eight to nine months um, because there's just so much radiology and you're not, it, it, each month's going to be a new month. You know, what's, what's, what's true in ultrasound is not going to be true on our CT body rotation. Um, of course, the anatomy is going to be similar, so we get some help there, but as far as the differences in modality and what you're looking for, it's, it's definitely a different world. And so um, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rough year as far as learning, um, and that was some of the reasons why we went to this new PGY2 curriculum uh, is to help with that. Um, but then as you progress to your PGY2 year towards the end, we end up uh, kind of moving you more into our ED rotation, so this kind of happens at the end of the PGY2 year. At that time, our ED rotation is a little bit more higher volume, but um, you're still not necessarily expected to to cover that. That's why we have staff available. Like, like Brett has mentioned many times, we have a very high volume practice. Um, and so that's why the staff are here. They're here to cover the rotation and make sure that all the studies get read. And you just need to go with the pace that's comfortable for you because we always have felt that, you know, if you're a good, accurate resident, you know, speed will come with time. And so, you know, being fast and floppy doesn't help anybody. Um, and so during that time in the ED, the first time you're going to be, you're, during the days, you're going to be there with the faculty in, in the room with you. And so if you have any questions or any concerns about something, you can just ask them very quickly. Um, and then as you kind of progress, you start ending up in, in our night rotation, which starts in your PGY three year. PGY three year, we still have staff overnight just because of the fact that we read out somewhere around 350 to 400 studies a night. Um, so really there's not a way for residents to be able to cover that amount. Um, and so we have re residents coverage overnight, a single residents covering it. And we end up, you know, anywhere reading from 80 to 100 uh, studies overnight pretty easily and then you know as you kind of progress you start reading more and more studies um but then and then that keeps progressing and so there's always staff in-house but they're not necessarily sitting right next to you and so you get that kind of autonomy of making decisions making those calls calling the physical clinicians when you see something abnormal um and, but they're there if you have any questions or concerns like do i really is this you know really something i want to call do i not want to call this because you know you're not going to know everything and there's definitely some real subtleties when it comes to you know some of the overhead overnight neuro stuff like I mean some of that stuff is very challenging for you know anybody uh, at any level and so making those calls you know and trying to get on the same page with, with, with your staff before um, it, before uh, you actually sign it and send it out is, is important and the other thing that's nice is that you're not wasting any with having a staff here you're not wasting time on the patient care you know the, the patient's getting the, the appropriate care you're not missing anything um, as far as you know taking care of the patient the patient's going to get all the appropriate care but you still have that opportunity to kind of Put, get get to read it first and get to kind of get that autonomy that you're looking for. And then as you progress even further along, once you're now in your PGY four and five year, now you start having these after hour five to nine shifts, which are kind of our moonlighting shifts a little bit. Um, and in those ones, you're essentially just reading and then you still have staff, you're just kind of setting it to, but a lot by that time you've read so many studies, you know, as Dr. Schnicker and others have mentioned, you know, we have so many studies that, you know, most people reach all their ACGM minimum requirements on their first rotations for everything. And so by the time you're a PGY-5, you read a lot of studies. Most residents leave here reading around 20, 25,000 studies during their, their course of their time. So um, they're usually very well prepared to go out and do whatever job market they want to, whether it's prior practice or academics. Um, does anybody else want to add anything to that answer that question? The only thing I would add is that, you know, it's approaching eight o'clock. Um, if anyone, yep. um, anyone can stay if they want, we'll still be on to answer some questions, but, you know, don't feel bad if, you know, you have other activities or things like that. Um, but I think James covered it very well. Okay. This next question that came up, uh, if residents are interested in doing research, will they have some able to have some protected research time? And the answer is we do have a research rotation that we have. Um, we used to be kind of standardized where everybody had a research rotation. Um, since then, we found that not everybody necessarily wants to do research. And so, um, you know, if you're definitely interested, we can we can block out some time for you. 
um, and make it make it work um, where you have time to kind of get a project completed if that's something you're, you're interested in. And, and I think that with our new, we also kind of revamped a little bit of our, our, our scheduling a little bit to where it's you know, very standardized across each year. Um, it's one of those things where we could definitely kind of make that work um, to make sure you you had time depending on you know when you were doing it because before it was only a PGY5 option and now I think we could probably make it work in a different year um, if needed um, to get a project completed. Um, but Dr. Schick can also add to that if you wanted to. Yeah, that is um, certainly doing a research rotation is is definitely still available because of the way the ABR um, core exam is structured. There's a limited number of rotations that you're going to want to do that are not part of that core uh, beforehand. Um, you want to make sure that you've covered. It's such an extensive exam. Uh, doing a month of research, while it's definitely a wonderful thing to do, you don't want it to come at the cost of your education in, say, cardiovascular or something like that instead. Because uh, ideally, you want at least three rotations in all of your core areas and the, the core exam covers 18 different sections. And so that's a lot of material to cover. Uh, on the other hand, doing a research rotation as a senior, uh, that's a fantastic time to do it, particularly if you have an academic interest. What we've seen over the years, as James mentioned, is that you, it's rare that you start and finish a project in one month. And so usually the, the best use of that research uh, month is to um, get one completely started and off the ground, or more likely and more often is to finish it all up. A lot of times you've gathered all the data, but then you need to sort through it, you need to write, you need to draft, you need to revise, you need to submit. And so that's usually the, the more um, useful um, uh, place for a research month, and that's usually going to be in the senior year. Um, but it's, it's like James says, the way our schedule is structured, we could probably do it in the junior year. I think it'd be very difficult. I'd actually, I'd got to say, I would be hesitant to do it in the first two years of radiology. You just have so much that you need to learn in that time. Um, and, and research is definitely important. I don't want to give anybody the impression that that's not. But in terms of the best use of your academic time during your four very short years of residency, um, you don't want to do that research month early. Very well put. Thanks, Dr. Schenker, for clarifying that. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat feature. Um, we'll stay on for another five minutes, um, but we'll. Um, but thanks for everyone for joining in. Um, you know, we'll we'll probably sign off here around eight ten. Um, but thank you all for being participants and, and asking great questions. Um, we pro we will have another session where we'll talk more just about our program. I know you guys end up asking questions about our program. Um, we wanted this to kind of be a little more for you guys specifically. Um, like I, like we mentioned, that if you were here at the very beginning, because um, we felt like as though um, there's just a lot of new information happening, and um, we, we've definitely compiled a lot of information from all our research we've done, trying to get ready for the season, you know, what what we need to do, what what works, what doesn't work, and so uh, we've tried to share some of those tips with you, uh, specifically about the interview day, um, but we will have another session probably in a, a few weeks just about our program itself, and so I'll, you know, I'll send out an email to all of you guys since you guys were all interested, um, and you're welcome to join. We'll, we'll lead it, and it'll be much more detailed, especially about our program and what, you know, our, how our program is structured. Um, but we wanted to kind of get this one out first just because I felt like everyone would have these questions um, and, and get that information out to you guys. So, but I really appreciate all the enthusiasm and interest um, today. I, it, was, it was really welcomed. Yeah, I, I want to reiterate that is how much we appreciate your interest in our program as well. I, I definitely appreciate you feeding all of these great questions that are more program specific uh, because we certainly don't mind that, that you have come to this particular session with an interest in us as well. We do appreciate that. And hopefully we can follow that up because uh, there were actually I was anticipating a couple more questions about the interview process as well. Um, so if we're going to be on for a couple more minutes, I'll throw in kind of my things that I thought might be useful, uh, particularly in this go round, having having been interviewed uh, and interviewing now as program director uh, for well over 20 years, I think 26 years I've been either program director or assistant program director. So I've done a couple of, of interviews now. And this year, I think to make yourself stand out, you want to make sure that you do a good job with your personal statement. Um, a lot of people, you know, they don't want to take any risks on it. And, and I would agree that sometimes people get bad advice when they're told that uh, it should be very creative. If you're not naturally a creative writing uh, professional, then sometimes that actually can work against you. It just makes it sound a little bit odd. On the other hand, 
I think doing uh, the personal statement should kind of tell people who you are and tell your story. Those are the ones that I really think that, again, tells us so much more about you, kind of telling your background, what your influences are, where you grew up, um, your mentors, key things that have occurred during your educational or, or personal life that have led to where you are. That That's the stuff that will make you stand out and be more memorable. Um, the same way is some people just absolutely pack their CV full of every volunteer opportunity. And it's not really a, a quantity game, uh, you know, it, and I think most people say, oh, well, you want to have something in every column. And there's probably some truth to that. But a lot of people, they'll spend one hour at something and they'll, they'll list it. And I know that's, that is somewhat of a game that is played. Um, but honestly, those things really don't uh, help your application as much as you think they do. I think it's better to concentrate on maybe having fewer of them, but more meaningful ones and be able to provide some details. A lot of times I'll ask people about some of these things that they've done and they really don't have any kind of story behind them. There's no detail about it. And so that makes me question, it's like, well, how, do I even know whether or not that was a real opportunity? So make sure, uh, I think early on, Brett mentioned, know your application forwards and backwards and be able to answer questions because that's what we're gonna be able to judge you on in terms of knowing you know, who you are and, and you know, what, what kind of fit you are for our program and vice versa. By the way, we ask questions, what we're interested in you, you can tell, are we the kind of people you want to work with for the next four or five years or maybe the rest of your career? <laughs> hey, one thing I would add is um, when it comes to your hobby section, you know, that's, you know, I, I briefly talked about that. But, you know, if you want to put more specifics in there, you know, definitely don't overlook it because it is something we talk about pretty frequently. Um, oh, it's so my, something's it's important my to you. favorite section, hands yeah. down. It's my favorite section. Yeah, so. yeah and that was true of fellowship as well. Um, our summary interviews blinded. Um, interviews aren't read your application. Um, I don't think we do that with any of our staff. All our staff have read the application. We, we kind of like it that way just so that we can have, they can have good questions to ask you and, and it can be a more engaging interview. This year we are going to have a, a resident or a kind of a chief led interview session. And that one probably will be blinded. Um, as far as all the different, uh, you know, things on your application, we'll probably just have your name and, and just some basic stuff of like maybe where you're from and things like that. But that's going to be more of a blind interview. So we will probably have blind interviews this year, but in previous years we had not. Um, that was just something new to be because of the fact that we are doing this virtual interview session and trying to figure out a way to get you to see, talk to the, the residents a little bit more and as well as kind of, you know, us be able to interact with you. Um, so that would be a, a really beneficial way to kind of have that mutually, uh, a mutual understanding and, and kind of feel each other out a little bit. Yeah, what I think you'll see in terms of, uh, well, you'll actually have some, they're not labeled as blinded. You'll have many interviews with people who clearly have not opened your application. You'll put hours and hours into that and they will have not read it at all. And that's a little disheartening, I can tell you. And so I've, I've always made it a point and for our interviewers uh, to make sure they spend time getting to know you um, and your application is part of the process. But kind of on the other side of that coin is there are usually some more standardized questions that you'll see. And I think that's the kind of thing that is good, particularly in this environment, so that you can compare people a little bit more. Um, I don't really like the, you know, the, the type of standardized questions that are more, um, well, for lack of a better term, not helpful. They're basically, they just seem like the thing to ask, like, well, tell me why you want to go into radiology or something like that, or tell me a challenging time that you had during medical school. It's not that they're bad questions. It's just that I think that there's other ways to get to know who you are as a person and as a future coworker better. So I would say from that standpoint, you can expect more of a, um, you know, semi-standardized questions that'll come within the process. And that way we can compare people and how they answered some of those a little bit more evenly. Um, what months this year do you plan to conduct most interviews? So this year it's a little, I mean, I think it's going to be very similar to our previous years. Um, we found that, you know, 
most of our interviews, I think, start. We essentially get your applications now a little bit later than we did in the past. We used to get them a little bit earlier, but now we have to wait for the dean's letter. So I think that's um, mid October now is when we actually get those. Um, Cause you guys, I think submit on the 15th, but we don't get all the information until after that, um, until we get your Dean's letter. And so we tended to have interviews kind of starting shortly after that. And then we would go into kind of late January. Um, cause we have to have our, uh, rank list submitted by kind of early mid, mid to early February. And so we have to have all our interviews done by then. I think that's pretty much what most programs do. Um, I don't foresee us changing that, that kind of timeline. It might be a slightly more delay just because of the delay in getting your information, but hopefully we can get through all the packets and be on time. Anything you want to add about that, Dr. Schnicker? Yeah, um, like I said, I think October 21st, uh, the ball drops on everything, uh, whereas before y'all were able to submit letters of recommendation, but it was the, um, the, the Dean's letter, the MSPE didn't get submitted uh, until a little bit later in this year, everything is is going to go live on the same day. So that actually is going to put a delay in terms of getting through the applications because obviously they're pretty extensive um, and we don't want to do a process where it's just by scores and class rank only. I I've never been a fan of that. Um, and so we want to go be able to go through them. So we probably won't be able to uh, do many interviews much before the very end of October. And so I suspect that we may go into the first part of February this year, just because once you get into Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's holidays, that takes out a big three weeks there that you just usually don't have enough faculty around to do that. Um, and because we're starting later, I suspect we'll go into early February. They push back all the deadlines for uh, submitting your ranks and final rank lists until later this year to account for that as well though. Okay, sounds good. And then this last question on multi -mini, multiple mini interviews. I know we don't use that format. Um, you know, that was something that I, my wife definitely did whenever she was applying to pharmacy school. Uh, I didn't do it for medical school. I know that's a new thing that's come out. Um, I'm sure there are some programs that are taking advantage of it. Um, but I feel like as though, you know, the type of, you know, we're trying to find out whether or not we're, we fit with you and can we have a conversation? Do we want to, you know, spend, you know, a whole day with you in, in the reading room? And so that's kind of where our questions tend to go. And I feel like we can kind of get that without doing some of these uh, these other type of interview sessions. I mean, I feel like most of the time, you know, we we interact with you know all these applicants, and you know, mo I almost I, almost all applicants are just great. I mean, I wish we wish we were getting a lot of a lot more than we have. Uh, unfortunately, we're limited just based on funds and, and resources. But uh, there's just so many great applicants out there, and um, I mean, you guys are all awesome. So. Um, I can't, I don't, I can't add anything more to that. I don't know if you guys have heard anything about other programs using it. Maybe you had some when you were doing interviews, Brett or Lillian. No, I, I have no experience with that. Okay. I interviewed it at some programs where there are a few more interviews than, than some others and they were shorter interviews. Um, but, you know, um, I think it's harder to make a connection and really represent yourself well um, you know, you're going to be in the interviews and it'll feel like it went by like this, um, even for the ones that don't follow a, a multi mini uh, interview. Um, but um, I can't speak on what every individual program is going to do, especially with the changes, um, if they're going to change their format um, from what they traditionally did um, now that they're moving virtual. But um, but it, it isn't impossible that some programs would go with that. Okay. Perfect. I don't see any more questions in the chat, so I think we're going to go ahead and sign off. It's now 8.17. Thanks, everyone, for uh, joining in, and thanks for the uh, uh, all the comments and questions. It was awesome, and uh, thanks for filling out the survey also. I mean, we definitely really appreciate all your all your concerns and things like that. Hopefully, we answered as many as we could here. Um, and like I said, we'll have another session specifically about our our program, um, and we'll, we'll be posting on social media like we did this one, and we'll definitely reach out to all of you again just because since you guys showed interest initially. Uh, we'll email you all with our all the stuff, all of the uh, information. So, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Appreciate Thank you. it. Don't hesitate to reach out. <laughs> yep. Thank you.